Hi, I'm Bob Ethington. And I'm Nick Nicholas. And this is From Akron and Beyond. Welcome, everybody. Our guest today is somebody we're all going to learn about uh, in during this podcast. <laughs> yeah, all, all and, and, and he's a fascinating guy. He's, <laughs> the story here is very interesting. And we're, we're, I'm going to save just for a second uh, who our guest is, but we're very excited about it. But before we begin, uh, Nick has a big announcement. So why don't you share that with the people, Nick? Yeah, we just got in the studio after a two-week break here. And, uh, you know, I know you, you – our listeners have been tuning in uh, locally, you know, for a few months now and uh, through the podcast on SoundCloud. But recently, uh, we were excited to hear that the uh, station has gotten us on uh, multi platforms, uh, podcasts, you know, through something called uh, Soundbean. Podbean. Pod, Podbean. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, on Apple, uh, iTunes, and. Uh, Spotify, Spotify. Yep. but we right. just got a, the station just got notified that we've been downloaded uh, over a thousand times on uh, through Podbean, and it's real exciting news. It's not just Akron. Now we Akron and beyond, we got the world out there now. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. It's yeah. a really big deal. So you just heard the mystery voice. <laughs> yeah. Can you guess who I, that is? I think my laugh is more popular than I am these days. <laughs> That's good. So, um, so before we begin, I, I did uh, in in uh, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. Our guest is Kramus, and uh, he is an Ohio gentleman, but he also uh, has. He, Love that. But he, well, he's from the big Akron area, kinda. And then he uh, has, <laughs> and but then he's an international artist as well. And in reading about him, and reading about his career, and looking at the body of work that you've come up with, it really underscored to me what an interesting and strange time it is now in the music industry. It really is. Yeah, yeah because I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> It there, there it used to be that I were falling into the old man talk that Nick and I often <laughs> I like it. I like it. But, you it. know, once upon a time, <laughs> uh, it was you know you got signed to a label and then you were promoted that way and you know your name was sort of out there and it didn't mean that your record sold necessarily or not but it was just it was a mm-hmm. matter of. Visibil- visibility, right? Right. And of course, it was limited. You know, only so many people, so many artists, so many bands got to have that mm-hmm. visibility. Um, today, everyone can theoretically have that visibility, but right. that means also it's not a small pond anymore. It's the ocean. Yeah. And you're basically, you know, uh, I don't want to use the word competing, but you're, you're, you, that's sort of what it is. I mm-hmm. mean, it's sort of like you're, you're hope, trying to get people's ears, you know, to pay attention to what you're doing or, or you know, what any artist is doing. And I play in a couple of bands, and uh, we put stuff online all the time. <laughs> and, and it's funny because it's like, you know, we'll put something online, and then, you know, six months later, one of the guys in a band will be, you know, we, did, we said that we hit a 1,000 downloads with our podcast. You know, I had this one band, he was like, yeah, we hit uh, – Six downloads of our song, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's like yeah. you know, and I think three of them I did, you know, <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's just it's just it's a weird world, and so anyway, with that in mind, we we have as our guest Kramus, who has worked with all kinds of people that, and and he has made some really beautiful records. If you're into you. sort of a, a a dream pop kind of uh, sound. Um, uh, he, he's uh, actually no one well, comes to mind offhand to compare his music to. It's very distinctive and really good. I really been l- digging going oh through gosh. your uh, thank you <laughs> this body of work. <laughs> yeah, and then Brad will be playing some yeah, some so selections everyone, later, so we get to hear it. Everyone will yeah, get a chance. All the big hits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Both of them. So yeah. now uh, we've tooted our own horn a bit, and I have <laughs> gone way off uh, the path with uh, my sociological comments. <coughs> so let's get to our guest. So, Kramus, welcome. And, Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here today. You do currently live in the Akron area, roughly? I live in the... Um, Hudson area. First of all, congratulations on the thousand downloads. That's a oh, big thank deal. You. That's, thank you. Uh, you guys should be really happy about that. Yeah, um, yeah. I live, my wife and I just moved back from uh, a year ago. Uh, we were gone for about 15, 16 years. Oh, we lived yeah. out west and we just settled back down in Hudson, which mm-hmm. is a nice experience. I wasn't expecting, you know, when you leave an area, you're one person. And then you have this mindset of how that place stays still, frozen in time. But you forget, like, I was really worried about coming back. I was like, what if it's the same place? Or what, you know, you have all these like hang ups. But this area is so progressive and Mm -hmm. things are changing so much. And like, as you change, places change. And it it, it was a perfect timing. It was nice to come back. And I really enjoy it here. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd miss the mountains, but, Uh you know. Yeah. If you kneel down, everything looks like a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> right? You, you, adjustments can be made. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I may, where are you from originally? I actually am from Ohio. I was born in a sleepy little town called uh, Fairview Park, Ohio. Oh, okay. Yeah. There is a bunch of stuff out there about my Dutch roots mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Um Lots of stories that have been told to me that are lies and <laughs> lots of uh, shocking truths that really, you know, I love spreading. I love spreading them. So I, <laughs> I, <laughs> but it's great. You know, I, there's, my dad used to tell me that my great grandpa, I don't know if I can say this. I'll just say it. Uh, the only, he lived to be 98 years old. The only reason why he died because he was hit by a horse and buggy coming out of a whorehouse. Uh, <laughs> I told everybody that story. I just found out this year it's not true. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's so uh, disappointing. Anyways, um, what were we talking about? <laughs> See, here's the issue. You gave me a swivel chair, and uh, I yeah, am yeah. not going to be able to stop. No, that's great. <laughs> Brad, can you just stand there and hold his chair? Yeah, yeah. will you just yeah. hold yeah. me still? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, how long have you been uh, consider yourself as a performer, you know, as, a, as an artist? So it was it was weird. I, there's no musical or art artistic people in my family. It was just, I was a really strange kid. I had a huge imagination. I was constantly creating stories in my head. I had no instruments, n- nothing. The only thing that I had was um, my dad had these old Dutch German kind of Christmas records, oh, like man. choirs and organs and like really dark Christmas stuff, you know. As, and then we, I had a haunted house record from Disney. Do you remember that old Haunted House record? Yeah, I do. I do, yeah. So when I was eight years old, I would put on my dad's uh, headphones, those big 70s ones yeah, with yeah, the yeah. coil and stuff, and I would lay on the ground and I would listen to scary Christmas music and Halloween Disney uh, for hours and hours um, until they took the headphones away and said I had to get some friends. But that still, <laughs> I still didn't, you know, it's just that kind of built my whole... Uh, idea of I guess that's what kind of influenced me the most but um, I think professionally I've been professional at this level since the age of 40 Mm -hmm. which is really telling because I've been doing this for years and I've done a ton of stuff I've opened for a ton of people but professionally 40 and people always say you know you got to make it early and all this stuff but you don't have to do that you could you could start Doing whatever you want to do, mm-hmm. whenever. Well, that's that's inspiring. Yeah, Nick, and I still got a couple moving. years left. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's very interesting, and I I think that that is sort of a that is sort of a phenomenon of of now in modern I, world. I, yeah, yeah, is that? Um, I don't know. I I don't buy into the you know. 50s to new 30 and all that kind of junk. I think that's a, stretching it a bit. But having having said that, I do think that 
uh, you know, it used to be like the, if you wrote a novel, for instance, mm-hmm. you almost had to be uh, over you thirty be was considered yeah. old yeah. to yeah. get your first no- novel published. Yeah. That's not the case anymore. Yeah, no, I don't know if that's just demographics shifting or something. It's, uh, it's just... Enough of people are older now who are still interested in mm-hmm. music and interested in yeah. you know literature or movies or whatever that it. Does it affect things the same? Or yeah, right. I don't know. That's I don't, interesting. It's just mm-hmm. Anything you set your mind to, you can completely not to get into the self help stuff, but you could completely accomplish anything at any age. And you know, you mentioned novels. That was actually, you know, like my biggest influences was like uh, Tolkien, like okay. The Hobbit as uh-huh. a kid. That's interesting. Uh, Charles Dickens. Uh-huh. All this is what I always thought I was going to be a writer. I always thought mm-hmm. I was going to write. But my attention span, just like this swivel chair, I can't, <laughs> I can't sit still, and uh-huh. so it turned into lyrics for me. I'll just go off on tangents. I'll go just ahead, man. Yeah, yeah um, go ahead. When I was little, I was like ten years old, and I went to Radio Shack, and they they were selling this brand new little keyboard. It was a Casio something. It was such a big deal, and. I was there with my dad and he hit the key and I heard a synthesizer and I was like, what the F is that? That (laughs) is everything to me. So my dad's like, well, if you, you know, you mow some lawns, um, you know, it was 1999. I remember. So I, I got like 22 bucks together over a couple months and I went to the radio shack with my mom and I'm like, I'm getting this thing, you know? (laughs) And my mom looked at it and she goes, no, that's a piece of crap. Mm -hmm. I said, this is visual. (laughs) <laughs> so I moved out. No, I did. I was 10. <laughs> I moved out at 11. Yeah. So, <laughs> screw this. But they <laughs> they ended up for Christmas getting me an acoustic guitar, <clears throat> which t- was the lifesaver. I'm glad. Mm-hmm. I'm glad. I don't even know what we're talking about. But I <laughs> I didn't know how to tune. I didn't know how to write songs. I didn't know how to do anything. So I just made up my own tunings. Yeah. And this is where the whole thing I do now stems from. So that's, Mm -hmm. I don't know when you become professional, like when you find what you love or when you get paid for what you do or Uh when you, people know you or when you, I don't, I don't know. Like when does a professional become a professional? Right. Right. You know, so yeah. Could have started at 10, could have started could be over tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's hard if you yeah, can when, do you, when are you a pro? Yeah. What, what does that, yeah, what does that even mean? Yeah. What, how do you, if you're performing for people and people are feeling good and like coming up to you and like, oh my God, I cried or I did this, you're a professional, right? right. You pulled feelings out of people. You made yeah. them feel something as an artist. Yeah. So mm. I think, you know, I guess we're all professionals somehow, mm-hmm. you know, at this. You yeah. Know? yeah. He's a professional. Look at him over here. <laughs> <laughs> He's running the show. <laughs> Brad's getting a shout out there, folks. Right. <laughs> Invisible man, yeah. or inaudible man, I should say. <clears throat> um, yeah, but, well, because I'm. A, a drummer, and I, I I've played in bands for years, and Unit Five, and, and Unit Five, yes, yeah. yes, and uh, and. Uh, Nick Nicholas, of course, is the leader of the Bizarros. Um, his one and only band all these years, but uh, they've I made they made an impact. Guys. That's for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. But um, you know, I don't forget me. I mean, or, or even Nick. I mean, the vast majority of people that we know who do music and take it very seriously and do perform it to you know at clubs or whatever yeah. audiences. We all had other jobs, right? Except, you know, we had that great interview, two-parter of the Numbers Band, just a few weeks back, and they're in their 53rd year. And up until there was like this tragic fire in Kent where they lost their equipment, they went, that was their job. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that was back in the 70s, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. could live cheaper, I think. Yeah. yeah. $100 yeah. a month split eight ways. Uh, yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. There's lots of ways to, like, make living off of, off of this with mm-hmm. sinks yeah. and TV and right I guess you just have to maneuver around you know my whole thing is is if I just keep doing what I feel is 
opening me up and like making me happy. Mm -hmm. Everything else just comes when it's supposed to come. Now, now it sounds like, uh, like the way you approached your earliest music with sort of your own tunings and probably uh, some open tunings and things like that. Uh, it can be. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Especially for shows or in the studio, there's this old, everyone makes fun of me because I can't read or write music. The Mm -hmm. tunings are all over the place. Each song has a different tuning. It makes no sense. <laughs> so they're like, they'll sit down with me and they're like, okay, show us what are you doing? Like, what do you tell us what you're doing? I'm like, I, I can't tell you yeah. what I'm doing, but I can show you where I put my fingers. They're like, oh, great. Kramus is going to show us where he puts his fingers. <laughs> like, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So it's always, it's always that. Like, I don't know what is going on. And but of course, with that tuning where you're putting your fingers isn't where it they doesn't even put make their sense. fingers. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I can't yeah. wait to hear some of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so who, when you think back, like who were some of the artists <clears throat> or bands or whatever that really kind of inspired you when you first decided that music was your passion? Uh, it was really... So I never listened to albums all the way through. I would get hooked on a song and play that cassette mm-hmm. a thousand times over, mm-hmm. and that's how I learned how to sing. Yeah, okay. But it was Hunky Dory by Bowie. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> One of our favorites here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That album just blew me away because in yeah. in between the songs you can even hear phones ring. You can you hear all that cool stuff that right. I, the music today is so clean and so done so well. Mm-hmm. There's no mistakes, and yeah. I just can't connect with that. That Bowie, that early Bowie stuff was yeah huge for me. Um, but then it it kind of flipped over to like old Jane's Addiction, Simon Garfunkel, and then Elton John. That's all how I learned how to sing okay. and to be uh-huh. weird. Yeah, that okay. taught me to be weird. <laughs> That's a great line. Or accept the right. weirdness or right. whatever. Right, accept yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> wow. You don't often hear Jane's Addiction and Simon and Garfunkel named right next to each no, other. No, you don't, as dude. influences. <laughs> I think they all had that, they had that essence of, again, like pulling something out of people, like making you feel... Whatever the emotion is, fear. Jane's addiction could pull fear out of you because mm-hmm. they were dark. They could pull love out of you. It was really a dark presence. But same with Simon Garfunkel. Yeah, yeah you know, absolutely. Like, they yeah. just pulled that right out of you. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm more attracted to than even the music. Mm-hmm. Is that, um, that? I think that's what I've been searching for in my music. Is like, how do you do that? How do you make that magic happen? How do you bring that? alive for people yeah yeah kind of stuff you know and yeah and it's tricky isn't it i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's mo- it's just pure moments in time like it's you know anyone can do it but it's just the right timing and mm-hmm. and it's usually the songs that are written in five minutes right <laughs> not yeah. the ones you spent 10 grand on uh-huh. six months on it's the one that you did in your bathroom uh-huh. while taking a shower uh-huh. On your iPhone, that's the one people love, you know? uh-huh. <laughs> which I don't suggest doing. But <laughs> I've lost a lot of iPhones that way. <laughs> so this is from Akron. And beyond, I'm your host, Bob Ethington, with my co-host, Nick Nicholas, and uh, we, <coughs> our guest today is Kramus, and we are talking about the wide world of music, and specifically his his uh, his own music. Um, I was, again, when looking over your uh, discography, I was just struck by, um, you know, the, the releases, how many of them are EPs, singles, whatever. There's, mm. you know, uh, you have the one album, which you've... My first LP uh, after all these years. Okay, yeah. 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 And I was going to say, that was the one first after, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, um, and then, of course, I've I've looked at names of some of the people that you've worked with, so I'd like to investigate that a little bit yeah. if i may sure. you overlap a couple people i know i know patrick carney yeah and um 
I know some of the guys in Guided by Voices. I'm a huge fan of yeah. theirs. Todd Tobias, you, you worked with him, right? Uh, yeah, he started. He he helped me. So for a long time, I was a um, when I uh, let's see when I was recording. I was recording mostly at Waterloo Sound Recording in mm-hmm. Kent, Ohio. Yes, okay. Oh, I was there when that started. Like I was one of the first people to record there, and um. So I didn't know Todd then, but they always talked about Guided by Voices. I'm very bad with bands and who people are. Like, it just doesn't stick in my head. Uh-huh. Um, but it was that whole cycle of people at that Waterloo Sound recording. And Todd was producing them at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, he was right. Like he was the guy behind the scenes. Yeah. Even the Robert Pollard solo stuff, Todd mm-hmm. was doing a lot of the music. Yeah, and um, he was a performer and like a engineer. He or... would he wouldn't perform. He was the drummer for a band called Gem, I think, oh, back okay. in the day. Yeah, but yeah. he what? I don't think Todd Todd is a real like. A, Todd is hysterical. They're, okay, so everyone <laughs> that I work with is like this. I'd be like Todd, you were mentioned in Damn Rolling Stone mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. He'd be like, Oh, really? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> what do you want to do today? Like he, he literally doesn't care. Uh-huh. I have everyone I know is just like that. I'd be like, I would be <laughs> freaking out, you know. Until and yeah. I've been mentioning a lot of stuff, and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm telling everybody. But Todd yeah. is like this grounded, deep voice guy, and I think we work well together because I say some of the stupidest weird. <laughs> and I never see him laugh, but when he starts laughing, <laughs> then I have an audience and like we, I just, it gets crazy, but yeah. he's a very, very intelligent. He's, re, he's like responsible. I remember going into a studio and he would have like four, four tracks all connected somehow. Like they were all like, all the reels were connected. Like mm-hmm. he was doing like that whole, uh, lo-fi thing yeah. with guided by voices right right. i could be wrong i know um tobin sprout was responsible for a lot but Mm -hmm. todd todd i think is a genius so Mm -hmm. i was i went i was in a band called okay so at 18 i was still solo and i was going into the studio and by um i mean i was being taken out by management companies and stuff like that Mm -hmm. like um but i didn't know what any of that meant so I decided it would be cool to get a really bad drug habit. And so <laughs> I became a huge raging drug addict Okay, for probably about 10 years. Mm-hmm. Todd came in the middle of that, saw the, like the absolute worst of me, mm-hmm. but he stuck with me. Then I got sober in 2004 and he's been, we've been working together on little stuff whenever I need something edited really quick or whatever yeah. Todd still does it so yeah. yeah he's he's a really good uh really good friend where's yeah. he based out of now Brexville really mm-hmm. yeah um he I'm not sure is he you know is he part of that revamped Suma I heard that they mm-hmm. have, just, no he has his own stuff in his okay uh, all right he took what we clo- they closed down Waterloo Studios in Kent and I I actually remember I was recording at Waterloo, and they said, hey, I know you have this blacked out, but a band called Guided by Voices wants to come in. They want to record an album in two days. I said, (laughs) who records an album in two days, right? Well, when you put out six albums a year, you record two. (laughs) Or more, right. (laughs) Um, And so all my stuff was in the studio, and they even used my piano and stuff like that. But I'm like, yeah, they could have it for two days. And Mm -hmm. so I took off. I came back on the third day, and that place was Trash. Oh, no. <laughs> there, it was. Tra- I've never seen so many, so much alcohol yeah, and beer. whippets yeah. and just <laughs> drug paraphernalia. Ever. They just left it the way they found it. And I was like, they must be cool. I was in that phase, you know what right, I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's my ramble on Todd. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> well, I'm as, as Nick knows. I am a. I'm one of those guided by voices super fans. Are you really? Uh, yeah, that's and actually. Cool. Um, I mean, I've seen them untold times. I went to Dayton for their 40th anniversary show. a couple shows. weeks ago, right? yeah, was, yeah, earlier, yeah. Yeah, I, my understanding is is that, you know, there's a whole history that we won't go into that, but, but when he was working with Todd Tobias, 
like Bob spent a lot of the time, like he would, just, or Robert Pollard spent a lot of the time. He would just, I mean, he's kind of has this dream thing for a musician uh, mm. where it's like he would send them these tapes, just mm. on a cassette tape, of him with like rudimentary guitar parts and him singing. Mm. And then Todd and the band basically put the music together. It's even I'm better. I'm not even than sure that. if he was even there with those guys. No. I mean, not that he, he is a famous yeah. uh, boozer, but I mean, I'm not sure that you know he was even there. I think for solo stuff, he might be. But a lot of times you look at those records and it's like Robert Pollard vocals. Todd, Todd Tobias, everything, everything. Else. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he would he would show up at the studio with a boombox yeah. that had a cassette in it, and this is Todd telling me this. Yeah. Um, it might have happened while I was there too, but I can't remember any of those times. Um, and he would say, "Hey, I recorded this on my front porch." Mm-hmm. So he would Todd would take that cassette, add all the instrumentation to it, and that would be his next solo record. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing to me. Yeah. Well, How, yeah, when I asked you earlier if he was an engineer, he, he's everything. He's I, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's he's so talented. And I try to, when I, when I find people that have that much talent, you know, because I don't. I, I really am, I really pull off a stunt. Like, I, I can write <laughs> songs. I have killer hair. I think that's the only thing <laughs> keeping me going. <laughs> People love I my can laugh. I for that, folks. You know? She does. <laughs> yeah. I'm very jealous. Here. People, <laughs> people love my laugh. Like even when I'm in France or wherever they, we don't. You know, the, there's a communication thing. They they just do anything to try to get me to laugh on the radio and stuff. And like, <laughs> but I'll take it. You know what I mean? I'll yeah. take it. But t- when I find people like Todd as friends and stuff, I try to push them. And so when I started getting more popular in my 40s and stuff, and, like, yeah. all this stuff started happening for me, like NPR, BBC, all the touring and stuff. Mm-hmm. I kept pushing Todd to release something, and so I started a little tiny record label just for my friends, mm-hmm. just so they had a platform, and I would get them, like, a premiere, or I would get them some reviews and stuff, Yeah, and it made them feel good because nobody's doing that for these guys that should be noticed right they should be in the limelight they should mm-hmm. be talked about and you know todd is known for guided by voices and robert pollard but todd is on his own mm-hmm. a, he's a, a master at what yeah. he does and stuff so i try i try to promote that as much as i can but some people have that that spark that can't sit still and some people are okay with who you know just being not too known. I don't know what that mm-hmm. is. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a it's, it's a different kind of ego. Neither one is good or bad. Right. But it's you know, I tend to surround myself with people that have like zero ego in the game, and mm-hmm. it's amazing to me. They always just surprise me. Yeah, and often they're extremely talented, right? Yeah. Extraordinary, and, 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 but they won't push that or or, right. or broadcast it in any yeah. way. Yeah, it's amazing. Before we get too far down the line, I want to congratulate you on your sobriety. That's not easy. So, oh, it's, no, it's not. It's not. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. it was two thousand four. Yeah, actually, it was. I have it tattooed right there. Yeah, seventeenth this month. Okay, wow. all right. <clears throat> so it's been like nineteen years. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's when you know when you are doing music and you're learning about yourself and you're doing drugs. You're literally just spinning in circles, mm-hmm. just spinning, 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 and you know, like it's fun, but it's uh, the minute you know I quit all drugs, every drug known to man, in one day, and um, I have a really cool dad. Like I never smoked, but he went out and got tobacco. He's like, you need to start doing something. So he like <laughs> showed me how to roll cigarettes, and so I started smoking. <laughs> Then you know what I mean, <laughs> and and then I quit six months later. But um, you know, at that point, I had done all this stuff with Waterloo, and it was all this grungy, lo-fi, just you know, kind of music. Mm-hmm. And I was just kind of done with it. And when I got it wasn't sober, you, what it wasn't your real music. It's right? not yeah. what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um. When I. Got sober, a really shady New York, stupid, 
label is like, hey, we'll just uh, why don't we just take all your music from the '90s and we'll just whatever. And I was done. I was like, uh-huh. I'm quitting. Nobody. I was told by some big record companies that I would never work in the business again. I had taken record company money, uh-huh. and I was supposed to have a demo, yeah. but I had a ton of cocaine instead. Uh-huh. Like it was, uh-huh. you know, I spent all the money. I was, you know, it, I was just a reckless, yeah, kid, kid, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. And so, um, uh, okay, see see what happens when you do drugs? What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't until I got so – so they took my old music. I didn't care. They were getting it placed on PBS, which I thought was weird because the music was horrible. But <laughs> um, I didn't really care. I wanted nothing to do with it. But then my – you know, I have friends in the business that are just like, dude, you have to keep doing this and you have to do it sober now. Like, you have to, like, keep going and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And, you know, six months later, I was recording four-track demos like I was when I was a kid. Yeah. And it just, and Todd was right there with me. He's mm-hmm. like, helped me get it off the ground. Nice. And in 2013, mm-hmm. sobriety really, really, I love the rock and roll life. Mm-hmm. I don't condone it. I don't wish addiction on anybody. Right. But I um sobriety was the key to me uh taking off on a certain level. Yeah, so. it sounds like you, your rejuvenation mm-hmm. creative yeah. I mean, tied done. in with that. I, yeah, yeah, I thought it was done. I was uh, like Yeah. That was it. You know? Which you know, sometimes people need to get away from everything they mm-hmm. were doing totally, to be yeah. able to stay sober. But you were that you didn't need to do that, and instead it went the other way. You're more creative now. Yeah, uh, it's it's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah that's I, awesome. I still have enough resin in my spine to probably kick in at some point. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I prefer sobriety. Yeah, uh-huh. big time. <laughs> So we mentioned also Patrick Kearney, mm-hmm. um, who, yeah, Nick and I both know. And, of course, you know, he's an Akron kid. And so I'm also really good friends with his dad. Uh, who we've had uh, on the show. Who we've had on the show, yeah, Jim Kearney, who was a awesome. reporter for the Akron Beacon Journal. But anyway, um, uh, so I sort of knew Patrick, you know, as he, was fir- as he and Dan were first even beginning the band mm-hmm. that would – and uh, – you know, traveling around in the van, you know, Working playing their anywhere. Butts off to get where they were. Yeah, yeah. For, which is, you know, the Black Keys earned what they got, that's yeah, for sure. It. Yeah. But um, how did you run into him, and, and what role has he played with your music? I I think, so we only knew each other through messaging. Mm-hmm. And I think people like Jason Lytle from Granddaddy and Jerry from Train, like, they're all friends, and, like, but they don't just work with anybody at any time. I think if I would have asked him to help with mm-hmm. that one song a couple of years earlier, it mm-hmm. would have been a no. Mm-hmm. I, I'm hope because I was getting I, a lot of like, um, I mean, I, I was in every blog and every indie underground magazine and stuff like Which, that. What is the name of the song? Days of. Days of. Okay. Yeah, and um, I think because. You know, there was an article that came out about me and it said that Kramis writes the shoulders of giants, which <laughs> I thought was sweet. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. Like if you're going to write anything, like, yeah. And so it kind of was just that kind of situation. And for many years, I've had a lot of, you know, well-known people pop up and just, I'll be like, hey, can you help me? And they'll be like, yeah, it's just, you know, nothing in this business ever just comes to you you have to go for it at a certain level and however it comes to you you gotta and walk through that door yeah you know i mean am i allowed to swear on this oh uh, yeah okay. it's okay yeah um here we go <laughs> storm <laughs> i you just have to walk through that door you're like i everything that has come to me i have fought for and i've got, gone after on a certain level and i just have a clear vision and however that vision comes to me but i with pat you know i messaged him and i said you know, so many people were producing my stuff and it had got so much success. I thought every year I think, oh my God, this is it. This is as big as it's going to get. Like, mm-hmm. even when I was little, I was like, I think I met Stuart Copeland 
Oh, whatever. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, I'm fam- This is it. I'm like, <laughs> this is, you know, or signing my first contract. I think that's it. Or NPR spelling my name on air. I was like, holy, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> you know, but it just, you know, people, when people like Pat Carney that have so much uh, talent and knowledge, mm-hmm. respectability. Yes, mm-hmm. from the ground up. Yeah. Hey, Pat. Um, <laughs> When he said yes, I was like, oh, this is it. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> and yeah. I've had 12 more this is it since then. But uh, he, I messaged him and, you know, Jason Lytle had been producing a lot of my stuff. Mm-hmm. Jerry Becker from Train mm-hmm. was doing a lot of stuff. Um, and Todd. And I needed, what happened in 2018 was I was getting Clash Magazine or some Billboard Magazine a bunch of magazines. It's almost like they got together and they coined me. Kramis is the dream pop, American dream pop troubadour. And okay. I was like, I quit. I was like, <laughs> the minute I heard that, I was like, oh no. So I went out to destroy that. So when I got a hold of Pat, I was mm-hmm. like hoping to destroy that. But the song came out so good, it just made it worse. <laughs> you know, and they, it kind of like coined a genre after the music. The, some, the French were calling it um, dream pop folklore. Okay. Because it comes back to that whole Hobbit, like being obsessed with Tolkien and mm-hmm. Charles Dickens. Like all my songs revolve around that kind of lyric yeah. world and stuff. So, yeah, Pat helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> great. great time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I'm very, I'm very, very, I can't say this enough. I would be nowhere without any of those guys. Mm-hmm. It's not, I mean, they... If you heard what I sent them prior, even Jerry from Train, I can send Jerry. I was in Ireland. I was living in a castle for a little bit, writing a, a record. Okay. Um, uh, and I recorded something on like a oh, really <laughs> task scam and a vocal. And then um, I said to the Jerry, and it came back full blown orchestra, best vocal. It didn't even sound like me. None of the stuff sounds like me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm working with Mario McNulty, um, who did Bowie. Uh, tons of Bowie stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's really well known, and um, I just heard the first single, and I was like, Nobody, nobody's gonna <laughs> believe this was me. <laughs> 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 this That's is true. so like the business <laughs> doing this. Like it's great that I don't sing anything out of tune. Mm-hmm. But if you were there, I was singing out of tune. <laughs> it's per. It's so good. Like, he's got. I would be nowhere without these guys. Nowhere. Um, now, just out of curiosity, did you go to Nashville to record with Patrick, or did, or how did you, that no, work? No, I went to, so I was in Denver, I split it up between two studios in Colorado, and then sent everything to Pat. Mm-hmm. Pat laid down, oh, that was the other thing, I thought he was just going to produce it and put it together, and I was like, um, I had a drummer lined up. I was going to say, he plays the drums He goes, that, no, no, so. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then I was like, oh, God. Yeah. This well, is as big as it gets. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, when I was listening to the song, I thought, that sounds like Pat on drums, but it, mm-hmm. I didn't have any list of yeah. who the musicians were. So. And he's, a, yeah. he's amazing, too. I remember the day he sent it back. Like, I, a lot of people, when they're like, hey, uh, your song's done, they send me the song. Pat said... Uh, sent version A, version B, version C, D, uh, E in the right, right. It, like it was like fourteen uh, versions of the song. I was like, ah, oh, put them all. <laughs> Should this just be an that. album of the same song? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it was pretty cool. So this is From Akron and Beyond. Uh, I'm your host, Bob Ethington, with my co-host, Nick Nicholas. And our guest today is Kramus. <laughs> and we're talking about his career. I think your career is unique. Am I wrong in this? It's, it's, it's unlike most people I've talked to. Just the your candor about your <laughs> own talents and your own approach to music. Thank and then just the people that you've gotten to work with and stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean... I I know Patrick and Patrick Carney well enough to know that he doesn't 
just work with anybody. I mean, if he was that, yeah. doing, if he was invested in th- this song with mm-hmm. you, it was because he thought there, it was worth it. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, and I'm sure that's the case just when you see the other names that you've worked with. I'm sure it's the case. So, you know, you've got the respect of uh, yeah, your it's, it's, yeah. A, it's amazing to me. Mm-hmm. That yeah. song and the Ohio I, I'll Be Fined from 2021. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. They were like mm-hmm. top tens. Mm-hmm. They were hitting number ones on college radio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were like doing, it was like amazing. And again, I know the names attached to it brought a lot of attention to it. And I think that I learned to really write from my, uh, I try to stay super authentic now to like who I am and mm-hmm. stuff. I know I'm weird. I know I can't sit still. <laughs> I know my voice isn't normal. My tunings aren't normal. And as long as I'm like, okay with that, that's where I write from. And mm-hmm. these guys just make that, they just brought that out. And so lucky that that was hitting radio like that. And still, but yeah. even the new stuff, the new stuff, there's a, you know, huge campaigns about to happen. And stuff, mm-hmm. So Great. All right. Um, I'm pretty. We're on the cutting edge of that, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I would play it for you, but I'd get sued over my own song because oh. of ma- the management. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> There's the music business for you in a nutshell. <laughs> are you actually uh, signed to a label now, or are you doing it so, on your own? Another crazy thing is I <laughs> I was signed to labels. I've signed to a ton of labels, but in 2018, I saw what the labels were doing. They hired. This person, this person, they hired this team, this team, and this team. And then they took 70% of the money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I said, yeah. I can do that myself. I have mm-hmm. enough, uh, you know, I've made, you know, I don't have tennis courts, but I'm doing okay. Like, <laughs> I can, I can, you know what I mean? Like, I, like, I mean, I did come here on a, a helicopter. A <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this scarf is, you know, <laughs> from France, right? Yeah. Um, I, so I took, I decided to just cut out the labels in 2018 and take a huge risk. And it's not really a risk. You're just betting on yourself. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. and I did it and it, it paid off yeah. in like a big publicity way, you know, mm-hmm. stuff. So mm-hmm. I really don't. Oh, but you know, just not to, I'm not going to mention names, but all the labels when I sent them stuff saying we don't know where to put you or we don't know yeah. where to categorize you or we don't know how this would sell or fit. They're all now contacting me uh-huh. now uh-huh. to see what I'm doing and stuff. So yeah. Interesting. And yeah. the answer is no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> so I want to ask you about, um, <clears throat> Playing out, playing shows. It mm-hmm. seems like it might be complicated for you with your different tunings. You have to have like two or three guitars up on stage. Five, five acoustics on stage. Five, oh. okay. Yeah. Five of them. Yeah. And I prefer to, you know, I have some really, I have studio musicians like uh, David Goodheim, who's been with me for a while. Uh, we joke because he's, you know, he said he stalked me for years until I said, okay. <laughs> um, but... Um, I'll play with other people once in a while, but when I like, I'm gonna do a few shows like on the road with uh, Tyler Ramsey from he was formerly a Band of Horses. And, oh yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's in February, so I'll have five acoustics with me, yeah. all tuned differently. Yeah, it gets yeah. very confusing <laughs> for me. You know yeah. what I mean? And like, uh, for everyone else too. Like you know, so. Thankfully, each guitar is a different color. So, uh, <laughs> and I write and I put move. <laughs> tape on there. And it's a guitar one, mm-hmm. and and now we're putting effects through everything, so it gets very confusing. Yeah, but you know, I only I've done the old school touring and like the shows to back in the day to like fifty people, mm-hmm. and to me, business wise, that doesn't make sense. No, All right. I, when a show comes up, like in France and stuff, I could, you know, it's theaters and stuff like that. I'll do that and I'll do five big shows or I'll do something interesting. I'm not, I'm not going to just play shows to play shows. So it's easier in that aspect that I'm not going, I'm not trying to be on the road. You know, Mm -hmm. that whole lifestyle is just rough for people. Unless you're getting 
proper attention. Mm -hmm. So see where the records sell, see what happens, and then go there. Yeah. You know, like, I just did last year, I just did a soundtrack for the first uh, French fairy tale adult book. So when you scroll your phone over the pages, it plays the music I wrote for it. It's okay. like a really cool concept. Uh huh. So I just did, so they're like, you got to do a book tour. So last October, I was just in France doing a book tour. Like, wow. It was totally unique, totally weird. And th there was really weird because I played, one of the shows were for children that loved the fairy tale book. Mm -hmm. And I played a few songs and then they all lined up. I looked at my wife. I'm like, what is happening? There is like <laughs> French children. I'm signing stuff for them. And I'm like, this is so, this is as big as it gets. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Um, but yeah, no stuff, unique stuff like that. So yeah. someone said, do you want to play this venue or do you want to play the basement of a tattoo parlor and we'll pack it? I'll play mm -hmm. the tattoo parlor. Sure. Right, yeah. right, right. Because yeah. it's seedy and weird <laughs> happened. <laughs> you might end up with a tattoo. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> now, when this actually uh, comes out, is it going to be hard copies too or mm -hmm. vinyl? And oh. vinyl and cassette, cassette, just limited runs okay. and stuff. I do, I'm a big fan of the download. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keeping track of the downloads and stuff. Yeah. And like, I have people that, um, I have people. We'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <they're... laughs> Your people are talking I don't have people. that. I'm, yeah. I'm sounding like I'm something, I'm so small. <laughs> um, but I, you know, uh, I do pretty well there and doing a couple soundtracks for some documentaries and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So This is a tiny bit off topic, which is, I guess, I'm known for by this point. I love it. But, I, I, but I, want, it. I wanted to ask, though, um, because it sounds like you have a pretty uh, strong audience in France, mm -hmm. and a really good friend of mine is oh, John Beck, Durf, Durf, the ca cartoon artist. He wrote My Friend Dahmer, the graphic novel. He's huge in France is the reason is I he, asked. Is he, cause, is he in Aguilem? Agu Aguilem? I don't know. France? Oh, well, he, he doesn't live there. He lives here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. yeah. But he goes like every, almost every year he goes on a like month-long tour of through France and yeah. Belgium, and it's just like that's yeah, really he's, cool. He's like huge there, and, yeah. and it's not just the Dahmer book, but you know he 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 has several books. They're like graphic novels, yeah. you know. And um, yeah, you were you were reminding me of this when you were talking about the fairy tale book that mm -hmm. you did the music for for the movie because, um, yeah, in France. Uh, graphic novels are considered high literature, mm -hmm. so it's not like you know here, you know, where where well, they're comic books or right, whatever. Yeah, yeah. They're still yeah. fans, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. there it's a whole different thing. But anyway, okay, I just wondered. Yeah, was the curious. Bizarre, the Bazaros had a record out in France too, and a sordide sentimental label. That's uh, cool. Yeah, man. And it's a great artwork. Uh, the artist was a Lulu Picasso. <laughs> Did and, you go over there? No, no, we. Uh, that was. Uh, Towards uh, the br near the breakup of the band, uh, first breakup yeah. back in uh, 1980, but uh, you know it was I'm really proud of that record. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool that you two were, from my research, like you two have like punk presence or like new wave presence. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's really cool. I watched a video at JB Down Under <laughs> from the <laughs> 80s. <laughs> I watched you guys. I can't remember where it was. Yeah. And I'm like these guys are cool. These guys are pretty cool. They're not just <laughs> You guys are like staples in the Akron, Ohio area. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. With over a thousand downloads now. Yeah, Did yeah, we say yeah. that? <laughs> hey, after your honor, it would be 1100, 1100 no type. <laughs> You know, I'm, you're going to be leaving. I have to put up with Nick on a day to day basis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be Troy Francis. Oh, that's my stuck, favorite stuck part. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> We are actually beginning to uh, run a little out of time here, I'm just noticing. So uh, it seems like we could keep this conversation going the, for the another hour. The beautiful thing about this is we, we actually have music to play, you know, and, uh -huh. uh, and, and you know, the, the listening uh, audience, you know, they can hear him, you know. Right. So we've been talking with Kramis, yeah. but you'll be able to hear uh, some of his songs uh, during the show. and. Uh, uh, hear what it, the buzz is all about. You know, one, one last thing: the 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 music that you brought for us. Okay, yeah. now are there songs that 
you think people should listen to that aren't on these discs? And how can they, are they on Spotify? Like, let's say, I want you to mention a couple that aren't on what, what you brought us. Um, all the physical copies have sold out. I think because I was laughing last night because I was freaking Trying to find out. It. I saw you on, on Instagram. And I'm like, how is yeah. my album mm-hmm. selling for $60 on eBay and I don't no. even have it? Like, no. well, do I need to buy this from someone just to get it, <laughs> to bring it here? To have a copy, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would say if you, this is so stupid. I'm, I am very humble. I just want everybody to know <laughs> I appreciate everything and I love everyone that's helped me. Mm-hmm. If you just Google my name, Kramus, uh-huh. there is like a hundred thousand horrible things about me and you will find it. No, it's not bad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's all nudes. <laughs> it's all nudes. So go Google Kramis. K-R-A-M-I-E-S. You'll find it. You'll find it every, everywhere. Okay. Like I'm not really, I'm so bad with the whole Spotify, YouTube stuff. You know okay. what I mean? But it's all out there. We just sir, do it DIY. We'll find it I, ourselves. I love DIY. Cool. Well, cool. one Forever. song, he's being uh, too bashful here. One song I would throw out there is Hotel in L.A. Oh, my God. You know How'd that you song? find that? Mm-hmm. I it? found it online. It was on. Uh, that is the uh, most lo-fi. I think Amazon Music. Okay. And okay. Uh, so I'm sure it's on Spotify. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. That song has a store. That, I recorded that at 5 a.m. acoustic okay. on my iPhone. Oh. Oh, really? And then my David Goodheim added a bunch of parts to it, and it ended up in every indie rock magazine. Yeah. And it just blows me away because it's so... (laughs) 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 But I love it. You know what I mean? Uh People like it. It's a cool song. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say my biggest one is Ohio, I'll Be Fine, and Days Up with Pat. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are the biggest ones. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, all right, we'll check him out for sure. Our guest has been Kramus, and it's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Great guys. meeting you. Yes, you absolutely. Maybe down the road we might have you back on. This has been, I feel like there's a lot more we could talk about, but we, we <laughs> certain, I'm looking at the clock here, and with the yeah. music, we're going to be out Sounds of time. Sounds good. But um, anyway, uh, this has been From Akron and Beyond. And I am Bob Ethington with my co-host, Nick Nicholas. Our guest has been the artist Kramis. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next time.